Okay, we're recording this meeting now. So, uh, my name is Brad Walchmitz. I'm an engineer who uh, consults with N the Nashville Department of Transportation for the Neighborhood Street Traffic Calming Program. We're very grateful that you're here to join us tonight to talk about James Avenue. Uh, before we get going, I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Lan, and I'll ask Lan if you could come off of mute and introduce yourself. everyone. Uh, my name is Lan. Um, if you guys have any questions during Brad's presentation, be, feel free to send them in the chat and I can monitor it and we can answer your questions after the presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Lan. So what we like to do is we'd like to give about a 10 to 15 minute presentation, kind of summarize the traffic calming program, uh, how James Avenue got chosen, some options to manage vehicle speeds on your street, and then what a design could possibly look like uh, as we move forward from this meeting tonight. Um, we, you, if you have questions or comments, there's a few ways you can do that. One option is you can wait until at the end of our 10 to 15 minute presentation. You can come off of mute and we can have some great dialogue. Um, another option is you can also type in your questions in the chat box if you prefer, and LAN will be monitoring that for after the, at the end of the presentation. Um, and that chat box, I believe when you're looking at this WebEx interface, it should be near the bottom right corner. There's a chat where you should be able to type that. Either way, we want to make sure that we uh, were able to get to all your all's questions and comments. So let's go and get going on the presentation. Lane, I may ask you to come off of mute again. I want to make sure, can you see uh, the title slide of the, title slide of the presentation? Yes. Looks Excellent. Good. Thanks. Then I'm going to assume everybody can see it. Just wanted to make sure really quickly. So. We like to start off by making sure everybody understands what is traffic calming. Well, traffic calming is a, a, the neighborhood street traffic calming program, and we're focused on residential streets, and we're focused on physical solutions to really encourage lower speeds over the lengths of those roads. So really quick, we like, like make sure we cover the three E's of traffic calming. Uh, the first is education. This meeting is a great example where we can educate you all about the engineering and opportunities to calm the vehicle speeds on your street, but you all are the experts of your street because you live there. So you can also educate us in addition to the data we have, you can educate us on some things that you're seeing as well. So this, this meeting is a great, a great example of that education. The second E is enforcement. It is absolutely part of traffic calming to enforce the posted speed limits. Um, and so it's definitely a, a part of it. At NDOT though, we don't have as much control over the enforcement part. It's important, but NDOT and the engineers, we don't have much jurisdiction over that, but we do have jurisdiction over this third one, the actual engineering, doing something to neighborhood streets and it, with the intent of slowing down vehicle speeds. One of the reasons the traffic calming program is such a priority in Metro Nashville this is idea of safety and having a vision where we have zero deaths on our streets. You can see here that a pedestrian walking on a street, such as James Avenue, they're walking in the roadway and, and they unfortunately get struck by a moving vehicle going 25 miles per hour. You can see they have an 89% chance of survival. Now, if you go all the way to the far right, if that car is going 45 miles per hour and the unfortunate crash happens, hitting a pedestrian, they have a 35% chance of survival. Metro Nashville and NDOT, we take this very seriously. This is one reason why the traffic calming program exists, is um, we don't we want to really lower these speeds. So if the unfortunate thing like a pedestrian crash happens, maybe there's a higher chance of survival. We like to make sure we educate people on this. There are over 450 streets in Nashville that have applied for traffic calming. Uh, James Avenue was one of those 450 streets, and about, oh gosh, I'm thinking almost eight or 10 weeks ago now, uh, 26 of those streets were chosen, and James Avenue was one of those 26, and that's why we're here. So of the 450, James was one of them, and we do it through a prioritization process. All 450 plus streets get scored. We go out and we collect how many cars are driving on the street, how fast they're going. We look at uh, things like, are there schools and parks and other walkable destinations along that street? Uh, does the street have sidewalks? Um, and then have there been, has there been a history of 
pedestrian injuries or even worse, pedestrian fatalities on the street. All 450 plus streets get scored with this data. And again, eight or 10 weeks ago, uh, James Avenue scored in the top 26, which is why it was selected with that grouping. But that's what Nashville does with every street that applies. Uh, so here's some of that data here. We are looking for at James Avenue between Robertson Avenue and Vernon Avenue. Uh, and you can see here the day that we collected the uh, the, the tra volume and speed data, there's a little over 22,600 cars per day on the street. If you look at that 85th percentile speed, that that's a pretty typical traffic engineering measure we use for actual car speeds. You can see that 37 miles per hour, it's well above the posted speed limit. That's probably one of the reasons on that pie chart, James Avenue scored as high as it did. Now you'll see here the street width. We're also going to look at things like how wide is the street. It doesn't really impact the scoring, but we just still note it here. Um, one of the unique things about James Avenue is the width actually really varies. Sometimes there's a little parking area. Sometimes the road is wider, closer to Vernon. So you'll see there it's 21 to 22 feet, but we know it actually changes quite a bit. We'll kind of touch on that later in the presentation. And then here's a here's a picture again. You all know where you live. We just always like to show a map. Uh, James Avenue is the the street in green, kind of centered. Um, so that's again what we're looking at. James between Robertson Avenue and uh, and Vernon Avenue, and then it stops uh, just before it goes over that bridge there. We don't go that far, but that green line there on James is a good indicator of what part of James we're actually going to be looking at for traffic calming. So. Now we want to summarize some of the options. What's in our toolkit for ways we can work to manage vehicle speeds along a street like James Avenue? One of the more common and popular uh, tools is, are these speed cushions. They are black rubberized modular devices that get bolted into the pavement. And you can see that there are sometimes two, sometimes there's three, um, but these are very common and we're finding they're effective uh, on local and residential streets for managing vehicle speeds. And you'll see there's a bullet on here that talks about emergency, it says reduced impact to emergency response vehicles. I'm gonna go to the next slide and then we're gonna come back to this one. So speed tables, if you'll notice, they look very, very similar to speed cushions. The difference is these speed tables go over across the entire width of the street with no gaps in between. So every vehicle that goes over the speed table is gonna go both of their wheel uh, paths are going to go over these speed tables. So that means everybody's going to have to go over these, which should lower speeds. But that includes things like emergency vehicles, even fire trucks and ambulances, when sometimes that might need to get somewhere pretty quickly. So all vehicles have to go over these. So I'm going to go back one slide. You'll see these speed cushions that they're six feet the width there. It says six feet. Um, that's designed because the front axle for fire trucks and ambulances are wider than our typical passenger vehicles. Their front wheels can actually straddle these speed cushions and not have to go over, go over them as much as they would with that speed table. Now their back tires have so much weight back there. Usually those tires, there's extra tires. They have to kind of touch on the ramped up parts. If you look at the, maybe the bottom left photo here, those rear tires do go over the ramped parts, but these still have less of an impact to emergency vehicles when you compare them to these speed tables. So for that reason, we usually look more toward the cushions, but just wanted to draw the difference. And if you have any questions, we can get to that here at the end of our presentation. But those are the two. Um, NDOT's been doing a lot of before and after studies because we understand that people want to know, are these speed cushions working? And what we found is yes. Uh, we've done about six before and after studies and shown that whether you're looking at the average 50th percent speed or that 85th percent that us traffic engineers really like to look at, um, we're seeing reduced speeds. These speed cushions along a street are having a positive impact to make streets safer and with vehicles going a little slower. Uh, so we, and as the year progresses, we plan on doing more studies to even further that, but we're seeing a difference. Another toolkit option, these radar feedback signs. You may have seen some around Nashville. It actually uh, radars your speed and flashes what your, or shows what your speed is. And if these numbers go above the posted speed limit, it turns red uh, to let the driver know 
that they are now going above the speed limit, red being bad. Um, we do see benefits for these on some streets. Other streets, not, maybe not as much. It really depends on the street. We've had some successes and then some where we've had to go back and kind of reconsider. Um, so sometimes these can be effective. They may be very good on James Avenue, or we may find these maybe won't be as useful on James Avenue. That's kind of one of our action items that we'll talk about a little later after this meeting. Uh, but radar feedback signs are absolutely some because uh, sometimes people do kind of just zone out and don't think about what speed they're going. This can have a positive impact for some motorists and drivers. Um, another example is narrowing with pavement markings. Each of these two streets used to not have those white lines on either side of the road. And it was just a wider piece of pavement. And the traffic calming program added these white edge lines because even though the pavement width didn't change, as a driver, just seeing those white lines sort of narrow our cone of vision of where we should be driving, it can have a little bit of a positive impact uh, on speeding, believe it or not. Um, so sometimes, for, especially when there's wider streets, uh, we do look at some of these white edge lines as either a tool or a solution or part of uh, a solution along with some other things. Another tool we have is traffic circles. These are like roundabouts, but much, much smaller. Uh, so they operate just like a roundabout. Uh, sometimes we'll look to see if we can fit these into intersections without widening the intersection, but sometimes they just can't fit because we want to be able to get a school bus to be able to go around these. And sometimes that can be the challenge. So if there are any locations on James, we'd love to hear that. We can certainly look into that, but oftentimes it just won't really fit without doing uh, any sort of widening effort, which is kind of outside the traffic calming program. And then this last, I believe this is the last toolkit here. Um, we're also looking at things like bulb outs, which on the left, you see those kind of vertical white flexible uh, delineator posts. Again, sort of just showing the driver, it's a little narrower area. It can have a positive impact. And then on the right, there's an example of something called a chicane, where cars must turn their steering wheel to the right and then to the left just to stay in the lane, that turning of the steering wheel can also have a little bit of a slowing and calming, calming impact. Again, that's usually better for wider streets when there's much, much more pavement width out there. But we do have seen some streets where that's, uh, that's helpful. Now, if we're talking about the traffic calming program, Lane and I, we are here, we are your people. Um, but you may have some questions or some things you wanna ask about that are outside of the traffic calming program. And that's where I'd like to make sure everybody knows about Hub Nashville. You can either go to hub.nashville.gov or you can call 311. That could be if you think a traffic signal is not doing what it should, or if you think there need to be more stop signs or additional signs somewhere, or if there's you know a tree as, as everything's blooming right now, the sort of blocking visibility when you're trying to turn onto a street, all those things are important. Hub Nashville is a great resource. So we always like to make sure people know about that. Also, if you ever have any questions in Nashville, Metro Nashville about walking, biking, uh, whether it's bikeways, sidewalks, and a Deerman here is a great resource at NDOT. And finally, if you ever as a neighborhood ever want to do something like an adopt a street or do like a neighborhood cleanup together, you can coordinate with JD Lane at NDOT to, uh, to work through that. So we also have to make sure outside of traffic calming, people that are aware of these resources. So thanks for bearing with us. And we're going to hop back into traffic calming here and uh, close this up. So this is what a traffic calming design could possibly look like on James Avenue. Now, we haven't done our site visit. There will be a second meeting in the future. I haven't had that yet. This is very, very conceptual. But we, we like to kind of put something on virtual paper and just show it to kind of get some feedback or comments. In this instance, each one of those trapezoids that are yellow with a C represent a, a speed cushion location, which is basically what that upper left photo would look like. So everywhere you see a yellow trapezoid with a C, imagine that photo in the upper left corner. And there's about, there are six locations showing this concept design between Robertson and Vernon. Now, we just want to kind of show you what this could look like. Um, Basically, between Vernon and Robert, there could be six locations. Now, we may do our measurements and do our site work as the, as the month of May progresses. We may decide five locations is more appropriate or seven, um, but six is a really good starting point for just what, what you might expect for a traffic calming design on a street like James Avenue. 
Um, one, so there's some challenges on James Avenue, which we as engineers love challenges. Uh, one of the challenges is that there's a lot of driveways on James Avenue. We try to make sure that we don't place these speed cushions right in front of somebody's driveway. So we're pretty excited to go out on our field work and really try to find the right spots for these. Um, another challenge will be, as I men mentioned earlier, uh, there are some places where the pavement area really expands on both sides or something just on one side in front of somebody's yard, you can park there. Uh, so we wanna make sure that when we calm the street, we can really calm the entire pavement area and not leave any pavement where people can just still drive dangerously possibly and go around these things. Uh, so we're gonna be looking at all of those factors. But this six cushion design, I just sort of a good starting point for what we might do. Again, we've only got like a few more slides. We welcome any questions or comments about this either in the chat box or again, I think we only have like three slides left and then we'll open it up to Q&A as much as you all want. But this is just something to kind of get your mind thinking about what traffic calming could look like. So we like to make sure people understand this process. Uh, so we're here at meeting number one. This is the first meeting. After this meeting, we're then gonna do those, that, those field visits, do some more design work, uh, or do our engineering and prepare a more of a final looking design than what we just showed on that previous slide. After that, we're gonna have a similar meeting to this one, a meeting number two. You'll get postcards in the mail. Uh, it'll be another meeting where we talk about traffic calming and go over the more detailed design where we'll get to go over each speed cushion location, whose front yard it's in, whose mailbox is it closest to. We'll have all the specifics. We don't yet, but we will have the specifics before meeting number two. And then after meeting number two, and we all kind of agree on the design, ultimately the property owners on James Avenue get to vote you will get to vote on whether the traffic calming design actually gets constructed. Um, and if two thirds of the people that vote, vote yes, we want it, you're gonna get traffic calming on James Avenue. But if you do not get the two thirds of the people that vote saying yes, then the traffic calming will not be built. Um, this is a program where uh, a, a citizen's application starts the process. We as the engineers work with you to prepare a design we feel good about for safety engineering but the final decision will go back to you all if you own property along james avenue between robertson and vernon so that's what that online ballot will kind of be um so that concludes our presentation gil thomas is at ndot he's he oversees the program and then my name is brad walchmidt uh working with ndot on this again lan lee is with me as well um so that concludes our presentation well, I'd love to kind of just hear if there's any questions. Um, Lan, real quick, I'd love to ask you to come off of me. Has anybody typed any questions in the chat box? No, there are no questions in the chat. Okay, well, great. great. Well, then what I'll do is I'll open it up to the group if anybody wants to come off of mute or if you just want to type questions in the chat box now. Either way, we'd love to hear from anybody. Hey, Brad, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, my name is Elaine Corn. I was the one who submitted the petition a little over two years ago and talked to all the neighbors. We got about 42 signatures. And so I have a couple of questions. Yes. With the pads, are you looking at doing the pads that are two or the three? Yes. So let me, um, I'm going to share my screen again while I answer your question. Okay. And the, the honest answer is we don't know yet. Oh, okay. because because we want to go out and do our field measurements because it really depends on the pavement width. You can see on the upper left example here, uh, that's a, another street in Nashville. It's it's a narrower street, so two cushions works. But on the, the examples on the right side of the slide, those are wider streets. If we had done two cushions on those other streets on the far right, there would have been extra pavement where, unfortunately, if reckless drivers still want to try to speed, they could just drive around them. We try to design these to avoid that. So that's why it's three cushions. Does that kind of make sense? Yes, and the reason I ask is when you come out here and you observe the traffic, you'll see this. But in addition to regular vehicles, cars, pickup trucks, we have a lot of commercial vehicles that are on much larger trucks, um, vans, we get you know, um, Cisco, Western Express, we get a lot of big trucks. Mm -hmm. My concern is that those will be able to skirt that cushion where there's only two. Right, and 
and that's why we're going to go out and we want to we, we want to look to try to design whether it's sometimes we do four so we don't have a photo of that but sometimes if the road's wide enough we do four cushions we ultimately the number is we want to try to minimize the possibility of somebody shooting a gap in a car or a big truck or going around we want to make sure that at least one of those wheel paths has to go over these speed cushions well in almost every place on james there's no going around because you're in the ditch very little right. right away before you get those ditches um so i guess let's see oh the narrowness of the roads Right now, if you observe when you come out here, some of the larger vehicles, especially NES, all the commercial trucks, and the school buses, a lot of times come over the yellow line mm -hmm. because you have mail, like you said, you have driveways, you have mailboxes. So they pull to the center, and if there's no other cars coming, I see that every day. So I just wanted you to be aware of that, that that's what the traffic does. Right, no, appreciate that feedback. And again, that's why we want to make sure in each spot we put speed cushions across the entire width of the road. So if anybody wants to try to not have to be calmed by these, we want to work to minimize or avoid that possibility. So that's kind of the thing we'll be focusing on. And I, I have driven the street once, but that's not enough for our design. That's why we will be back out there doing some more detailed measurements. But I, I also recognize that there's some locations where the pavement does widen out, maybe in some people's in front, near some people's driveways or in their front. It's almost like a little parking area in some spot that's been paved. We're even going to be focusing on those areas just to make sure we don't miss anything, I guess, to create an effective design. I know the street, I know the street quite well, and there's only a very few places that are like that. One is in front of the church. They have a little excess pavement there, pavement there. and then further down, of course, closing getting close to Vernon, where the mm -hmm. um, two abs or I don't know, the whole thing's called two avenues, but that complex down there. Right. And and, and that's a good example. You, you just, that, that last one you just mentioned is exactly one that we, we've sort of noted. And like, we, we would want to make sure that two cushions uh, wouldn't be insufficient. We would want to make sure that we can really cover the entire width of the pavement there. Um, and so, and I think there's one example, there's one area kind of between Frisco Avenue and 23rd Street, where on the, I believe on the north side, there's a little bit of a paved parking area. Um, again, I don't, I'm not familiar with the area as much as you are, but those are from my notes. So just anything like that, we're going to really be pretty thorough in trying to make sure we don't miss something. But that's going to drive our decision on whether it's two or three of these, or even four if we need it, based on the width. And then, of course, I can't really tell from the map where your position positioning is. And I'm assuming the positioning on the map is just tentative to give us an idea. Absolutely. So okay. typically we try to space these speed cushions apart between 400 and 500 feet. The reason is, is we don't want to place these things too close together, like grocery store parking lots. That would just be a little too much, but we also don't want to space them too far apart because then the drivers still want to drive dangerously, have more uh, distance to pick more speed up. So 400 to 500 feet is usually the spacing we try to achieve. Um, so we, we haven't really vetted all these locations thoroughly. Again, that's sort of our homework after this meeting is to go out and really look at it in more detail. The challenge is going to be with some of these driveways. We try to avoid putting these cushions right in front of driveways. But James, compared to some other residential streets we've worked with, really just has so many driveways on both sides of the street. Um, it'll almost be like thre threading a needle, but we're prepared for that challenge and look forward to it. We're almost like a neighborhood, right? <laughs> Except we have all this traffic coming from Centennial and Briley. So one other comment is that where you place the first one, I'd like you to pay attention when you go out there to the fact that drivers stop at Robertson and Westboro, and of course, actually, you're going straight across to James. When they stop there, because of the traffic on Robertson, when they get a break, they tend to floor it to get across Robertson. In fact, we just had another accident there April 18th because people try to get across. So they floor it. So when they hit James, they're already screaming, a lot of them. So I just want you to keep that in mind so that we kind of slow them down before they really pick up speed. Yes, thank you for that comment. 
Uh, that's something we do work to do in our designs. The Federal Highway Administration actually encourages exactly what you're describing, that, that putting the first speed cushion somewhat close to where they, the car previously stopped to not even really give motorists the opportunity to speed too much. So that's something we'll definitely be looking at on that first one closest to Robertson. And I also submitted a, a stop sign request to look at this. Gil said, had me send it to him. And I realize you all don't do that, but um, we were really hoping to look at the stop sign situation because of that problem at Westboro, James, and Robertson. And then, of course, we have no, we're the only street in the entire area that has only one stop sign at James and Robertson. And the next stop is the, tra the traffic light at Centennial and what becomes 63rd. We have no intervening stop signs for all this traffic to try to get out and then cross Robertson. Right, and the stop signs are a great thing that you can submit to that hub Nashville. Um, we don't consider stop signs to be traffic calming. They're more of a traffic engineering uh, right. control measure. So the traffic calming program won't be adding stop signs, but you can absolutely reach out to that hub Nashville to make sure that that gets looked at to see if it is appropriate to consider more two stops. Two years ago, yeah. And okay. Okay, well, that's it for me. That's why I just wanted to make sure you aware of what we see every day, especially me because I'm home. Yes, well, thank you very much. We do appreciate that feedback. Um, Brad, we have uh, one question in the chat from Nicole Anderson. She asked, why were the why were the cushions selected versus the other options? Yes, so the speed cushions were chosen. The first thing is we do find one of the more effective traffic calming measures are when cars have to go over something. So in that case, speed cushions or maybe speed tables. Um, I mentioned it earlier, but I'll just kind of reiterate to make sure I, I, I communicate effectively. Um, speed tables, every vehicle will go, have to go over these, including emergency vehicles when they're responding, such as fire trucks and ambulances. These speed cushions do provide the gaps, which helps with the front axle of the wheels. And it, they still will go over the ramped up edges, kind of shown in that bottom left photo there with their back wheels, but it still has a little bit of a less impact to emergency vehicles when you compare them to the speed tables. So for that reason, we've leaned toward the speed cushions. Uh, initially, we thought about radar feedback signs. Again, some streets, these are effective. Some streets, they're not effective. We feel like we'd like to go with the cushions, uh, at least preliminarily on James Avenue, just that we think they might be a little more effective compared to the feedback signs. And then uh, James Avenue isn't as wide as some streets. I think I mentioned it was 21 to 22 feet for the most part. Um, and so, we, we want to maintain about 11 feet in each direction on our street. So there's really not much opportunity for those wide edge lines. That's why we're not showing that. We haven't found any intersections, again, initially, where a traffic circle could fit in the intersection without widening and still have a school bus go around it. Uh, so that's why we haven't shown any circles. And then again, bulb bus and chicanes are usually when the street's just wider, sometimes I call it excess pavement. We want to sort of just narrow it in and repurpose it. Um, but again, James being relatively a narrower street compared to some other streets that are wider, that's why we didn't go with that. So that's sort of our summary for why our preliminary kind of concept design, we're showing the speed cushions. Hey, Brad, my name's Kyle Anderson. Uh, thank y'all for all the work y'all put in so far on this. Um, I've been on James now about five years and I have two young children, as you can probably hear in the background. But um, my question is, what's the time frame on this? I know where we are now with meeting one from your graph, but when do you expect meeting two and then construction or what's your typical from what y'all have done in the past? Yes, so we, we're, we're working we're hoping that we will be able to prepare a design, get a second meeting scheduled, get the mailers out, and then actually have a second meeting maybe eight weeks from now. Um, that gives us time to design it, to get the coordinate with the, the neighborhood lead, get something scheduled out three or four weeks out, get the mailers out and do that. Um, 
the, 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 the great thing is we have 25 other streets just like James Avenue, not, not just like, they're all unique, but we have 25 other streets that we're doing all of these. So we're trying to balance everything uh, and move everybody kind of along at the same pace. So probably about eight weeks from now or so, you could have that second meeting. After that second meeting, we'll, after if everybody's all good with the design, that's when we'll send out those online ballots. Those mailers will go for you to vote online. And that's a six week voting period. So after that second meeting, the six week voting period will happen. Then after the six weeks, if it's, if it's a successful vote, then uh, it could take right now, it, it might take up to six months from that point to actually get the traffic calming measures installed. And the, the good news is this traffic calming program has become so popular and all these streets are having yes votes and we're making these streets a little safer by lowering speeds. That's the good news. The bad news is that there's only a few handful of contractors that, that, that are available to do this type of work. And so the backlog, we're just working through that backlog every week, but every week we get more deployed, a couple more streets get their yes votes in. So that's why it may take that long after the successful vote, if it's a successful vote to get constructed. So maybe eight weeks from around now to meeting two, after that six weeks for that voting period, then after that, it could take up to six months. NDOT's really working hard to let decrease that time, but the reality is to get the materials ordered from the vendor, then to get the contractor, it get, you get you add to the list, but there's so many streets because so many of these are being successfully voted on. So that's kind of the long-winded way of saying from today, what I do, eight, eight weeks plus six weeks plus six months. I think I just spelled out nine or 10 months right there. Um, so that's probably the time frame we're looking at for when these could get deployed. As far as the voting, I guess I talked to Gil about this. I thought it, the only people voting were those who attended the meetings. Is that not that, true? That is incorrect. Um, every, every property owner who has property that touches James Avenue between Robertson and Vernon should have gotten the mailer for tonight's meeting. Uh, now, whether or not they attended or not, that's their choice, but they should have gotten one. Meeting number two, we'll do the exact same thing. Every property owner along James between Robertson and Vernon will get a me meeting mailer for the second meeting. And then the third round of mailing, so that online ballot, same grouping. They will all get the opportunity to vote. They'll get a mailer to do that online voting. Uh, now, the voting, the two-thirds, the 66%, that's only going to be measured by who all actually votes. So if there are people who don't attend any meetings, if there are property owners who just don't vote at all, it doesn't help or hurt the score. It's only going to be based off of who votes yes or no. The, may, the, the maybes or I don't cares don't count either way. Does that kind of clarify? Yeah, and I'm sorry. I think that is what Gil told me. It's only 66% of those who vote. That right. That would make sense. Okay. No, that's great. We, we always want to make sure we're over-communicating so that we make it clear. I mean, so I'm I'm so glad you asked so we could make sure we clarify that. Well, anybody who's online is interested and when that happens, wants to go around and talk to our neighbors, I'm willing to do that. I put an email out to all the people who signed the original petition. Um, so I would have thought we, unfortunately, we didn't have as many on tonight, but maybe the next meeting will be more. And, and something that NDOT's been doing, I mentioned at the beginning that we're recording this meeting. Um, NDOT's been posting these on YouTube. If, if you go onto YouTube and search Nashville traffic calming, you can actually see many, many previous recent meetings. And if you give it about three or four business days, this meeting here will be on YouTube. You just got to search Nashville traffic calming. So if there are any property owners on James who didn't make the meeting, but you want to make sure that they kind of know about it, you'll be able to send this link in this presentation we're saying right now and, and talk this discussion we're having. Uh, any of your neighbors can see that on YouTube in the future. Okay, thank you. Yeah, what are some other uh, thoughts or feedback or questions anybody has? Um, we have two comments in the chat and one question. I'll start with the comments. Uh, 
Stu Steen said the Robertson James Westboro intersection would be great for the traffic circle if it fit. Okay. Yeah. So that's something we will absolutely go back and look at. We'll look at that um, that intersection down there as engineers. We can we can see if a circle would fit without widening, and if a school bus could still go around, and we can either include it in the design or if we don't show it, we'll be prepared at the second meeting to explain what we looked at and why we've excluded it. But either way, we can take a look at that. And then, Is there anything else at Robertson? that intersection if the circle won't fit that could be done if we can't get a stop sign there um no let me ask, make sure i understand are you trying to put stop signs on robertson avenue itself i don't know again that was the question i asked what can we do because that's the problem coming westboro james across and people being able to get across there's been a number of accidents like i just said one as recently as april 18th Right. So, so, we're, so we're focused on James Avenue. And so if you're going south on James Avenue, you have to stop at the stop sign, I believe, at Robertson. And then right. if you're if you're turning from Westboro or Robertson to go north on James, we're, we plan on designing our first speed cushion kind of in, a, in, in close proximity to that intersection. So anybody who wants to try to drive too fast, that first speed cushion will hopefully uh, deter them from doing that. So that's our design thought initially. I'm not sure if you had any other ideas, but we don't plan on doing anything with Westboro or Robertson in the traffic calming program. Well, that's what the other person was just asking. Can you do the traffic calming at that, I mean, the circle at that intersection? Right, and I may not explain very well, but we will absolutely go take a look at whether a traffic circle will fit, but we need to go see if it'll physically fit in there um, you know, and see if, if we agree with that from a, the engineering standpoint, but also can it actually fit with a school bus being able to turn around it, or if it's too small of an intersection, we can't squeeze it in. That's what we have to look at. And then I guess my follow-up was, if that won't work, is, is there anything else or no, you're done because that's actually Robertson? That's, that's probably, that's probably all we'll look at because you know, we're focused on James Avenue, not Robertson okay. Avenue. All right. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, the next comment from Leslie, she said, not a question, just a consideration when potentially placing speed cushions. I live right by the intersection of James and Franklin and have almost been in multiple accidents exiting my driveway due to excessive speeding going down the hill with limited visibility for me to exit my driveway. I'd love for a way to slow drivers down at the top of the hill to give me more time to safely exit. Yes. Yeah, so that, that's a very good thought. So a few things on that. The first thing is, yeah, our hope is that these speed cushions will lower vehicle speed. So when you're trying to turn out of your driveway or any of those other intersecting streets, our hope is that just like these bar graphs show, in general, cars will be traveling on average at a lower speed compared to what they are right now before the cushions. Um, I, I know there's that hill there, and I did want to make sure I mentioned one of the other things that we'll be doing during our field visit is to measure how steep some of these hills are. Um, I don't recall there being, compared to some other streets, James Avenue doesn't seem to have too many steep hills, but this is one location where we're going to go out and measure how steep it is because sometimes we, we're not able to put cushions on in a particular area of the street. If it's too steep, we could put it at the top or bottom of hills, but not right in the middle of a steep hill. Um, that may not be an issue at this particular one. We may go out there and see that it's a hill, but it's not too steep of a hill. But to address that concern, the cushions in general should lower speeds on James Avenue, but we're also gonna be looking at where the hills are and how can we best treat the hills knowing we can't put them right on the steep parts of the hills if they're too steep. And if not, would you consider doing one just before the hill and just after the hill, regardless of the rest of the installation? That is, you got it. There, um, there are, I think, maybe three or four weeks ago, I did three meetings in a row where they all have one steep, steep hill. Again, I'm not sure James Avenue has one too steep, but we're going to go out and measure to sure. But and what you just said is exactly what we do. We try to put them 
at the bottom of the hill, at the top of the hill, so that we sort of manage their speeds as they approach the hill, since we can't actually put one right on the steep part of a hill. That's usually our design approach. And one more question from the chat from Luke Myers. Are speed limit signs within scope of the calming program coming over the bridge from the Morrow side towards Robertson? I see speeding cards flowing down when they do see the sign later on. Gotcha. No, that's a very good question. Right now, more speed limit signs are also part of like a hub Nashville request that you can make. Um, we will share that with Gil at NDOT, who sort of oversees the traffic calming program. But if you do feel like there should be more speed limit signs, just to remind drivers of what the speed limit is, that's another thing you can either call 311 or you can go to hub.nashville.gov and submit a request for something like that. So I would suggest let's do it both ways. We'll talk to Gil and NDOT about we heard this from the James Avenue neighborhood meeting, but I would encourage you to also do a Hub Nashville request, um, sort of get, get, take two different approaches. We appreciate these questions and comments. These are great. What, what, what else do y'all have? Hey, hey, Brad, this is Stu Steen. Um, I, I don't live right on James, but I, I've lived in the neighborhood close by for over six years now. Um, I really, I'm glad that this is happening. I really like, you know, I think this is definitely needed. Um, but I did have a question in regards to all of the plans so i i walk down crowley drive okay kind of you know branches off i i walk down that road almost every day and there's a every day when i walk there's cars that use crowley as a cut through from robertson to get onto james where it intersects halfway through on this part and you know they're they're cutting through so these are you know cars that are trying to be traffic and go faster in general, but I'm, I'm concerned that doing this will have an unintended consequence of making that problem even worse on Crowley. Crowley's a smaller road, 25 mile an hour speed limit. Is there any way to incorporate Crowley? Do you, when you do this study, do you kind of take a holistic approach or is that possible where you think about, you know, what the effect that these cushions will have because I, I'm just concerned that this will make Crowley Drive a uh, just absolute hot mess. Right. No, thank you for that comment. And I, I really appreciate you bringing up Crowley Drive, what your experience has been and what your concern is. Um, th the reality is we don't know. The reality is that it could cause some vehicles to want to use Crowley Drive instead, or it may not have much impact to Crowley Drive at all. Um, we just don't know. We get this question quite a bit. And I guess one option would be, let's just not do anything on a street like James because we don't want to impact any other streets. Well, we will, we want to make sure we're addressing a concern and an issue like James. Um, the a, a second option would be, let's just put speed cushions on every street. And, and that kind of gets carried away. You know, we can't, there's not enough budget for that. Kind of just too. So what we, what we, our third approach, our third, the third option, which is what we try to do is let's focus on the street, James Avenue. Let's acknowledge that it could have consequences. Maybe, maybe not, but we would encourage you to go, if you have a concern to submit an application for Crowley drive, um, whether you have a concern in the near immediate, or if you want to wait to see if, cushions are successful in James and if they get built and if it has it, that's why we NDOT advertises the applications multiple times per year. So if there are any changes in traffic patterns for any reason, uh, neighbors get the opportunity to submit their street for consideration and it goes through that same graph. So the answer is you might be right um, or it might not have any impact, but you do have a voice to be able to apply for Crowley Drive. Independent of whether James is successful or not, you, you're free to submit for Crowley. <laughs> Um, for consideration. That's kind of, it's not the, it's not a perfect answer, but the honesty is there's really no way to forecast that. But if it does create a different problem, we will want to know about it in an application for traffic calming. It could score Crowley high enough to then we deal with that street.
can I say something to Stu? Yeah, sure. If you're on Crowley, I know some other people live on Crowley. I'd be glad to help you with the traffic calming application. There's also some uh, participatory uh, budgeting money that you can put in for, maybe get it sooner than waiting on the traffic calming. So I'm at 607 James. If you want any help, I'd be glad to help you with that because it's absolutely going to affect Crowley. It already is affecting Crowley. People yeah, are putting no, down Crowley now. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, I, I think Crowley's been submitted before. So I'm just, uh, and and I, I want it to happen for James. I just, I think Crowley's the one road that will be definitely affected. And I just wasn't sure if they do. I, I Brad, I know you were showing before and after on the road you changed, but, you know, I, I guess it seems like you do look at these roads independently, which makes sense, but. Yeah, we'll just have to work on Crowley more after this. I, I will tell you as a traffic engineer, I wish we had access to all sorts of data. I would I would have more fun than I should just looking at all the streets and the volumes and the speeds. But the reality is it's so costly to really get that much data that we we end up really focuses on the, the project street itself um, and then trust in the neighbors so if another problem arises to let NDOT know, submit an application, and perhaps that other street uh, could get some traffic calming. Yeah, okay. Uh, no, thank you very much. Hey, you're welcome. Um, we have another question. Nicole yes. asked, could you speak to the cost of these cushions and how the program is funded? Absolutely. So I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but each speed cushion is around, I want to say $1,500, maybe $1,500 to $2,000. That's for the material and installation. Uh, and so uh, each one is those. So in that photo right there, take that number and multiply it by two. So if I said $1,500 to $2,000, where you do two on the street, that's more like 3,000 to 4,000. So that's roughly the cost of the speed cushions. Uh, the, the, the shapes of them as far as how long they are can vary, but that's generally what the cost is for each speed cushion. As far as how the, the program is funded, it's funded by uh, local Metro Nashville taxes. Uh, so there's no state or federal funds. This is local Metro Nashville taxes. Um, this is not my field of expertise. I believe the council uh, determines the budget each year. Again, speaking out of turn, so I don't want to say anything too much because that's not really my field of expertise. But the, I believe the council works with the departments to determine the budgets. Uh, and so a traffic calming program budget is set uh, each year. Again, I couldn't quote that number off the top of my head, but there is a traffic calming line item budget for Nashville streets. Um, and so that designation of taxpayer funds uh, is where the funding for all the traffic calming comes from. And she asked also, are there any criteria other than the 85th percentile speed that resulted in our selection? Absolutely, yes. Let me make sure I go back here. So all, so again, over 450 streets have applied for traffic calming and James is one of 26 streets that actually got chosen. All 450 streets, get scored through this process here. Speed is one component. You see that there, uh, it's the blue and the pie chart. We also look at how many cars a day are on the street. We look at things like schools and parks. If there's schools and parks, that's gonna score higher because people are walking more to go to those types of destinations. We also look at things like, are there bike lanes or sidewalks, uh, more pedestrians and bicyclists on the street. And then we do look at if there's been a history of pedestrian injuries or even worse, pedestrian fatalities on any of these streets. And we wanna score those higher to really address those if there's been a history of that type of crash. So all 450 streets, including James, we look at all of these factors. And again, eight weeks or so ago, James was one of the top 26. And that's why we're here talking about James. So speed is absolutely a part of it. Going back to that 85th percentile of 37 miles per hour, it accounted for 45% 
of that score. But there were other factors that James and all the other streets in Nashville with applications that were looked at. We really appreciate these questions uh, and comments. This is great. Um, we're here as long as you need us to be. Uh, what what else what else is on anybody's, anybody's mind about tra traffic calming? Hey Brad, Kyle Anderson again. Um, I know your the numbers y'all showed show you know the cushions do help, but what if somebody you know is still going to speed through the street and go over them as fast as they can? Will they have a negative impact on their vehicle or? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm gonna. Are they gonna have a negative impact on their vehicle? I'm not sure. We haven't really heard much feedback about people's complaining about these cushions tying it to like a negative impact on their vehicle. So as far as the Well, I'm not talking about really the people that live on the street. It's just, you know, the people that speed, you know, right. is it like could they still just go right over them? Or is it going to be more of like a just like a huge speed bump or it's it's going to be i'll tell you it's going to be very uncomfortable for them but i try to make sure i communicate comfort is relative we, we typically feel like 20 miles per hour is about the average speed that people go over these speed cushions but some people may want to slow down to 15 to go over them or some people may be comfortable going 25 over them still so comfort is relative so I suppose there could be some drivers that still want to try to speed very fast over them. I would think that would be a very unpleasant experience, but I guess it's possible, and that's sort of their choice. Um, but in, in general, we do see it has a pot. So these, you'll see these this bar graph. These bar graphs show success. There may still have been some really fast speeders, unfortunately, in this data set. Our hope is to try to decrease the number of cars that are going that fast, but sure, there still could be a few, possibly. Yeah, appreciate it. This, is, this has been a wonderful meeting. I really appreciate all the dialogue and Q&A. Anything else anybody has? Okay, well, really appreciate it. This has been a wonderful uh, comments and question and dialogue. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, so our next steps are we as the design team are going to work with NDOT to go do our field measurements, do a site visit, look at some of the parameters and try to prepare a more specific design. Again, this, this, um, this initial, that initial concept we showed, we're going to be more zoomed in on our next meeting and actually show exactly whose front yards whose driveways and mailboxes it's closest to. Um, I feel like that meeting number two could happen in about eight weeks from now, um, because we're working on 26 streets total, trying to move everybody along at about the same pace. Um, and so that's kind of our assignment. I, I would say they're, they're really the only action items for you all are two things. The first is just make sure you spread the word to property owners along James. This YouTube video should be up on YouTube. I would say in three to four business days, um, and also, if, if there's any of those Hub Nashville requests, whether it's for more stop signs or more speed limit signs, please go to Hub Nashville and uh, make those requests because, yeah, that could also help in addition to the traffic calming that we'll be working on. Well, great. Well, thank you, everybody, and uh, appreciate your time and hope you have a good rest of your evening. Thank you. We appreciate your time and all the work to do this because I think it's going to make a we get it, hopefully, we're it's going to make a big impact. The quality of our lives and the people who live on James. Excellent. Look, look forward to the partnership. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. Thanks a lot, Brett.